Welcome to our live webinar titled Unrelated Donor Transplant Versus Immune Therapy for Pediatric Aplastic Anemia. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lee Clark, patient educator with the Aplastic Anemia Foundation, and I will be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I'd like to recognize the generous support of Bristol Myers Squibb, Alexion, Apellis, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Agios, Takeda, and Genentech, as, as well as the generous support of our patients, families, and caregivers for supporting our webinar programs. Teleconferences on the internet, it is possible you may lose your connection during the webinar. If you are unable to view the webinar online, you can call in to hear the audio portion of the program using the call-in number in your reminder email. Today's program works within two to three business days. You will be notified by email when it is live and ready for viewing. Immediately following the session, to all questions today. When asking questions, I do respectfully ask that you do two things to help us manage the incoming questions. First, submit your time. Second, please do not share private health information in your question. Our speaker cannot answer any specific questions related to your health care. Today's specialist is Dr. Timothy Olson, who is an attending physician in Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where he serves as the medical director of the bone uh, and marrow transplant program. Welcome, Dr. Olson, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Lee, for that introduction. So what we're going to discuss today is a bit of a hot button topic in the care of pediatric patients that are newly diagnosed with acquired aplastic anemia. And that is for patients who lack matched sibling donors, what is the preferred upfront therapy? The traditional approach of trialing immune suppression therapy or um, the, the newer approach of offering upfront unrelated donor transplant. Next. So we're gonna start by reviewing a bit of background regarding severe plastic anemia, particularly in children and our diagnostic approach to this disease, um, which are topics that matter when considering what therapy to pursue. I'll then set the stage by briefly touching on current outcomes with the gold standard therapy for pediatric aplastic anemia, which is matched sibling donor bone marrow transplant. And then we'll launch into a discussion of first uh, unrelated donor transplant, discussing both current outcomes as well as complications. And finally, we'll end with a couple of slides discussing how I got families and making decisions between these two treatments. Next. So I want to start by giving you a little bit of my background, though, as I think I have a unique perspective for this topic. Uh, I'm a transplant physician. A ago now, I was asked by Monica Bessler, the founder of our comprehensive bone marrow failure center, at to join her team, initially the dedicated bone marrow transplant physician patients with over the years though the hematologist the interim director of the program for a couple of years after Dr. Bell's retirement before the so I've treated quite a number of patients with now uh, next now in the last program at CHOP, which is a part of our next slide. In my capacity as a bone marrow transplant physician, we have developed a growing program dedicated to patients with diseases, particularly bone marrow failure. Uh, and one of the primary reasons for this growth Slide. 
one of the primary reasons last few years has been the increasing interest in unrelated you can advance the slide please great um, so when i see patients with aplastic anemia i see them from the perspective of both the bone marrow transplant physician i do feel that i'm not intrinsically biased between the depression my patient, and I've unfortunately seen both of uh, these treatments come up a bit short. Um, so one of the keys to successful treatment outcomes in a plastic and in fashion, and that's what we want to talk about. Perfect. Um, uh, here's a typical presentation that I see. So this is a case of an eight-year-old boy no prior medical problems except for respiratory or uh, family history is pretty unremarkable except for a few scattered the patient has bruising and petechiae and some larger uh, purpura uh, mm, uh, well and mental abnormalities and no signs that are concerning for leukemia such as uh, lymph nodes liver Lineages, which are the white blood cells, blood cells and the platelets. Mm, there are no leukemia cells that are seen. Uh, so if you hit next, so we do a bone biopsy, uh, which shows the slide, which shows that the marrow is empty, what we call marrow aplasia. Um, next. So this story is a classic presentation of acquired aplastic anemia in child children. And over 75% of pediatric aplastic anemia is what we describe as idiopathic or mediated. And we'll talk about what that means in the next slide. And for now, 10 to 50% of is also associated with what is short-lived hepatitis, which can be a mild hepatitis and just be associated with markers, or it can be pretty severe and associated with liver failure. Less commonly, aplastic anemia is caused directly by active viral infections or by drug or other chemicals. There are two peaks of aplastic anemia across the human lifespan, one that occurs in mid-childhood, one that occurs um, uh, in older adults. It's important to note that aplastic anemia can occur at any age. And you may have been surprised uh, to encounter pediatricians who aren't very familiar is that aplastic anemia is much more rare in childhood diagnoses such as leukemia, and many patients end up receiving care uh, in specialty programs. Uh, next. Um, so what causes aplastic anemia? And I'll try to limit the scientific jargon that I use here, uh, but as this is one of the processes that my lab studies, I, I'd be remiss to not mention a little bit more. Um, so currently we believe that a plastic anemia is triggered by an exposure, in some cases a virus, some chemical, and, and in many the exposure is not known. Regardless, this exposure triggers blood cells, uh, and this type of heat cell would normally be deleted from the human repertoire, but unfortunately these cells, these cells then activate and after they migrate to the bone marrow, if you advance the slide, uh, uh, suppress blood production by one or of two mechanisms, and it's still debated how much each of these mechanisms contribute. They kill bone marrow stem and progenitor cells, or they known as cytokines. This latter mechanism is why immune suppression therapy can work, because if all the cells were destroyed by T cells, you wouldn't expect blood. Slide. Uh, lastly, it's important to distinguish acquired plastic anemia from inherited causes that lead to exhaustion of stem cells. Necessarily involved. Next slide. So, for anyone listening with a new diagnosis of pediatric aplastic anemia, yourself or a family member, if you remember nothing from this lecture, here's really the 
from the 1980s and prior to that, diagnosis of acquired aplastic anemia in children carried a very diagnosis. And most children, unfortunately, did not survive. Advance the slide. In, but in 2020, um, uh, thanks to the work of researchers, including those at the NHLBI around the United States and, and around the world, things are quite different. And nowadays, we fully expect the majority of and while deaths unfortunately still occur, these are quite uncommon. So if you find that the discussion we're about to have about therapy choices is stressful and worrisome, remember what we're talking about the differences in therapy intensity and how long it may take to achieve. But regardless of the prospects for a cure are great for pediatric uh, patients with anemia nowadays. So one of the first things uh, that it's important to get right is making the correct diagnosis. Uh, this is critical for proper treatment. And I point this out because acquired anemia is only one of the many causes of low blood counts with mariaplasia in childhood. And a lot of the other blood uh, causes are linked to including other acquired conditions as well as uh, the inherited bone marrow failure. Now, all of these diagnoses are relatively more rare than acquired aplastic anemia individually, but collectively they add up to in about the same number of patients as acquired aplastic anemia. Uh, so the critical thing to get right from the beginning is making sure that what we're dealing with is truly acquired aplastic anemia. Next slide. So what do we do to try to come up with this diagnosis? Well, it starts with a good history and physical exam, uh, and then it moves into blood testing. So uh, uh, checking the blood counts, how severely they are affected are important. Looking at blood bank testing to figure out if there are antibodies destroying blood cells. Immune system testing, looking for deficiencies of the immune system or other signs of autoimmunity. Any evidence of hepatitis matters. We'll get to uh, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria or PNH a little bit later, but we want to assess for a clone in our initial workup. Um, uh, we want to do virus testing and we want to look for um, vitamin and mineral deficiencies that can cause low blood counts. Advance the slide. Um, bone marrow aspirate and biopsy is central to the diagnosis. So this is really what defines aplasia and, and, and how full the tank of the bone marrow really is here. And it also screens for myelodysplastic syndrome. Um, are the cells normal in appearance? Uh, is there any dysplasia? Are there chromosomal abnormalities that we need to be worried about? Um, and are there any acquired gene mutations in marrow cells uh, that we need to be worried about? Next slide. Oh, uh, before the next slide, um, and we also get HLA typing to begin the process of trying to determine who the uh, optimal bone, uh, bone marrow donor might be if a patient uh, decides to pursue bone marrow transplant. Next. Importantly, in terms of definitions, what we're really talking about for the rest of this talk here is severe aplastic anemia and very severe aplastic anemia. Um, severe aplastic anemia is defined as having a low bone marrow cellularity in severe, uh, severely low blood counts in at least two lineages, either neutrophils, platelets, or red cells, which is measured by criteria according to the baby red blood cell number, which is the reticulocyte count number. Um, only patients with severe or very severe, which is defined as uh, patients who have very low neutrophil counts, uh, are eligible for transplant. So these decisions that we're talking about uh, really are just in the severe category. Next slide. Um, once we've defined a patient as having severe aplastic anemia, the next step is really determining whether the aplasia is due to acquired autoimmune aplastic anemia or to one of the inherited bone marrow failure syndromes. And why is this important? Well, because treatment approaches are very different. Acquired aplastic anemia can be treated with immune suppression, whereas inherited causes um, stem cell transplant is the only cure. And in patients with inherited marrow failure syndromes, there can be effects in other organ systems that need to be figured out early because it can impact uh, how one prepares for a transplant. Um, the other reason uh, why this is important is, uh, if you, uh, next slide, um, is um, because it has implications for inherited, uh, uh, implications for other family members. So, um, 
Uh, oftentimes uh, with acquired aplastic anemia, there's only one family member affected and it's rare for multiple family members to be affected. But for inherited marrow failure syndromes, it's, it's usually the case that other family members are affected. And so genetic counseling and, and family member testing is critical. Some family members may be affected by the same disorder and don't know it yet. This is something that we call incomplete penetrance. Uh, and then uh, lastly, we're oftentimes considering family donors for bone marrow transplant, and it's important for us to make sure uh, that the donor uh, does not have the same susceptibility to bone marrow failure that the patient has. Next slide. So there are some clues that you can get from the medical history as to whether or not bone marrow failure is inherited or acquired in cause. Um, inherited marrow failure tends to have a slow symptom onset, a long history of somewhat low blood counts, family history of blood disorders, and then other developmental or, or other uh, system abnormalities. Uh, in contrast, acquired bone marrow failure usually presents rapidly there's a history of prior normal blood counts. There's no family history. There may be a preceding viral illness uh, that served as the trigger for this. And if there is a family history or personal history, it's often one of uh, other types of autoimmunity. Um, next. I will say that there are exceptions to both of these trends. Uh, and I've certainly seen patients with acquired aplastic anemia have slow symptom onset. And likewise, patients with uh, diseases like Fanconi anemia very rapidly drop their blood counts. So this is not foolproof. This is really just a general trend here. Uh, next slide. Um, the key in testing for these inherited causes is, is uh, functional testing. Uh, and functional testing looks at characteristics of cells and not just gene sequencing. And there are two functional tests that should be done in all patients who present with aplastic anemia to look for two conditions. The first is Fanconi anemia, which can be diagnosed by something called chromosomal breakage testing. And the second is uh, uh, short telomere diseases, which used to go by the name dyskeratosis congenita. And the, and the functional test for this is telomere length analysis. Um, these are critical diagnoses to rule out before you consider treatment because one, if patients have these, they have to be uh, treated with bone marrow transplant. And two, the bone marrow transplant has to be done quite differently than it is done for patients with aplastic anemia. Next. Um, the more controversial aspect of testing for inherited causing, causes is uh, genetic sequencing. Um, and this looks for gene mutations a patient was born with that lead to bone marrow failure. Uh, and some of these conditions are, are evolving. Uh, they're new, uh, newly being discovered. Uh, and um, the real question in the field right now is whether these are all required uh, for a patient who presents with uh, classic aplastic anemia. But we do this testing in patients uh, who have presentations that are suspicious for an inherited marrow failure condition. And there are several different ways that you can do this. Um, you could look for genes one by one, which is what we used to do. And this can be pretty fast uh, when it, where a specific disorder is, is suspected, but it can be pretty slow uh, if there's a panel of genes that you wanna look for. Uh, and in that case, it's better to do what's called a sequencing panel or an NGS panel to look for these gene mutations. And then finally, you can do something called whole exome sequencing, which is great for discovering new causes of bone marrow failure uh, but it's expensive and can certainly take some time and it can sometimes take too much time uh, to be useful um, uh, when one is contemplating therapy. Uh, next slide. And just to give you a sense, these are all of the genes that have now been uh, associated with mutations that predispose to the development of bone marrow aplasia, MDS, and leukemia in childhood. And most of the panel type testing that we do for these um, syndromes now include uh, most of these genes. These genes were taken from the panel that we have developed here at CHOP uh, to screen for hereditary predisposition to bone marrow failure and aplasia. Next slide. And then lastly, before we launch uh, more into the treatment algorithm, I just want to mention HLA typing because this is part of the standard workup for patients with aplastic anemia. Um, at CHOP, we test the patient, we test all full siblings, and if there are no sibling matches, we test parents. 
Uh, what we're doing is we're looking for the sequences of HLA genes. And, and uh, to make a long story short, HLA genes control T cell responses. And the ones that we type for are HLA A, B, C, DR, and DQ. And these are all encoded on a very small region of chromosome six. So what this means is you typically inherit these as a set from both of your parents. Uh, and this is shown in the bottom right here, uh, where you look at the two sets from uh, a father, two sets from a mother, and you typically inherit the entire set from, um, from a patient. Uh, so if you advance the slide, um, what this means is that a sibling has a 25% chance of inheriting the same set from the father and the same set from a mother. A half sibling, unfortunately, has a very little chance of being a full match. Um, and parents, as a consequence, are typically a, a half match or what we call a haploidentical match. Now, once in a while, there is a crossover between a parent's two copies of genes um, uh, that occurs before uh, a child is made. Uh, and, and this leads to uh, diversity of the haplotypes of HLA um, uh, types that are out there in the population. And, and this is the reason why, if you look for unrelated donors, there are chances that unrelated donors may be an eight out of 10 or a nine out of 10, or perhaps a, a, a 10 out of 10 match. Um, and, and, and so when we search the National Marrow Donor Program registries, that's the type of match that we're looking for. Next slide. So what is the treatment for severe aplastic anemia? Well, the historical algorithm that's been in place since the 1990s um, uh, says that once you've established the diagnosis of acquired aplastic anemia, which is what we've already talked about here, the first thing that you do is, is you try to determine whether or not a patient has an HLA identical sibling. If yes, then the treatment of choice is matched sibling donor bone marrow transplant. Unfortunately, only about 15 to 30 percent of patients in the United States, depending upon ethnicity, will have a, um, uh, a matched sibling donor. Um, and uh, if uh, a, a sibling donor is not identified, the historical approach has been to pursue immune suppression therapy. Now, there are a couple of potential outcomes of immune suppression therapy, if you advance the slide. Uh, the first is that immune suppression therapy can lead to count recovery with no concerns of what we call clonal evolution. And in this case, you can uh, start pulling back the immune suppression therapy and observe. Uh, but another outcome, next, um, is um, patients become refractory or relapse uh, or perhaps even develop MDS. And if that is the case, then the uh, preferred treatment is moving forward uh, with alternative donor or unrelated donor transplant. So what we're really talking about today, uh, next, uh, is whether there should be a new arrow created which is based on the improving success of unrelated donor transplant uh, relative to what we've always seen in matched sibling transplant, and also the relative likelihood that patients end up in the green box of good response to immune suppression therapy versus the blue box of a poor response. Uh, should patients be able to be offered upfront unrelated donor transplant as an option? Next slide. So where did the historical treatment algorithm come from? Well, it, it actually came from data that uh, originated in the late 80s to early 90s, which shown, showed that the best outcomes for overall survival for patients were to pursue matched sibling donor transplants. Uh, the second best were immune suppression therapy. And back in that time period, the outcomes for unrelated donor transplant were really quite poor. Uh, if you advance the slide. Uh, one of the reasons for this, though, is, is um, if you look at the timeline of the evolution of bone marrow transplant, um, really in the late 80s, early 90s, matched unrelated bone marrow transplant was in its infancy, and we were just learning how to do this well uh, as a field. And, and so these outcomes started to improve by the late 1990s. And if you look specifically in pediatric patients uh, by the 2000s, um, uh, what you see is, is that the outcomes for matched sibling donor and unrelated donor are now roughly about the same, uh, uh, with uh, a slightly better overall survival than patients who are treated with immune suppression therapy. Next slide. All right, so next we're going to touch on matched sibling transplant, and then we're going to get into immune suppression uh, versus unrelated donor transplant. Next slide. So 
without a doubt, if there is an available donor uh, and if patients are fit for transplant, matched sibling donor bone marrow transplant is the treatment of choice for pediatric severe aplastic anemia. So dating back to the late 90s uh, and certainly uh, in the modern era, um, overall survival and disease-free survival with matched sibling transplant is greater than 90%. At CHOP in the last 15 years, knock on wood, our survival um, uh, and disease-free survival, meaning your curative aplastic anemia has been 100% in this patient population. So this has really reached the level of success where now the next challenges for match sibling transplant for us are figuring out ways where we can make uh, the regimens that we give as part of transplant less toxic. Next. So the conditioning regimen typically for patients with uh, matched sibling donor has been ATG and high doses of cyclophosphamide. And most of the side effects are, of this regimen are attributed to the high doses of cyclophosphamide. So cyclophosphamide is the type of um, uh, chemotherapy medicine known as an alkylating chemotherapy agent, which means it can have significant short-term side effects, including bleeding in the bladder and, and kidney toxicities. And it can have severe long-term side effects as well. It can impair pubertal development. It can cause infertility, particularly in post-pubertal in individuals. And it can lead to early gonadal failure. Um, so we set about a few years ago seeing whether or not we could reduce the intensity of these regimens for matched sibling transplant uh, while maintaining efficacy with the hopes that uh, we could reduce some of these long-term toxicities. Next slide. So we set up a clinical trial a few years ago uh, that looked at uh, substituting another chemotherapy medicine called fludarabine, which has much fewer uh, long-term side effects than cyclophosphamide, uh, allowing us to lower the dose of cyclophosphamide in our regimen by 40%. Now, ultimately, uh, the measure of success for this will be whether or not it improves fertility, but that's a hard outcome to measure because that's, a, that's something that takes decades to be able to figure out. Uh, next. Uh, but what we've done so far is, is prove that uh, uh, this regimen with lower doses of cyclophosphamide is at least as effective um, in matched sibling transplant for aplastic anemia. So if you look at the, the number of patients that we have treated with this regimen that have aplastic anemia specifically, uh, we've treated 11 patients at this point. All of them have done well. Uh, we have 100% survival. Uh, none have developed graft failure. Uh, none have developed severe GVHD. And if you look at the percentage of donor cells, what we call percent donor chimerism, it's equal with this regimen compared to the old regimen of higher doses of cyclophosphamide. And so we're hoping this is a prominent, uh, promising strategy for the future for these patients. Um, next. All right, moving on to the main topic of, of this uh, uh, webinar, which is the choice between immune suppression versus unrelated donor transplant. And I'm going to talk a little bit first about immune suppression therapy. Next. All right, so what is immune suppression therapy? Well, first, let's talk about timing. Um, if you advance the slides here, um, oh, perfect. All right, so uh, the timing, the immune suppression therapy may start uh, once you have uh, testing back to rule out Fanconi anemia and telomere diseases, and once you have HLA typing that shows no match sibling donors. The goal is really to start within three to four weeks of uh, the diagnostic bone marrow studies. Um, we provide supportive care, including certain types of infectious disease prophylaxis. We do not typically use a medicine called GCSF, uh, which boosts neutrophil counts in some because mainly it doesn't work in that many patients with aplastic anemia. Um, uh, and there haven't been studies that have shown benefit. We do um, process the blood products that our patients with aplastic anemia receive through leukoreduction and irradiation to help prevent complications from these blood products, which could impair future therapy. Uh, we try to maintain safe platelet counts and hemoglobin values. And then we begin to set up the inpatient mission, which starts off immune suppression therapy um, for the medicine called antithymocyte globulin, or ATG. And we always give this medicine through a central venous catheter. And we uh, tell patients to expect approximately a one week long admission for this. Next slide. So equine ATG is a medicine, it's essentially antibodies to human T cells that are derived in horses. Uh, there's another form of this that is derived in rabbits. 
Uh, when you use equine ATG, you give it over a slow infusion through uh, that central venous catheter for four days in a row. Because there are major risks of severe allergic reactions that re require prompt medical attention, ATG requires hospitalization to give. There have been studies that show that equine ATG induces superior responses to rabbit ATG, uh, though equine is not available in some countries. Uh, and we will use rabbit ATG as a second line if, uh, if patients fail the equine and for whatever reason they're not a candidate for transplant. We give the ATG with uh, steroids, uh, prednisone or the IV form. Um, uh, and the goal of this is that while it does provide immune suppression, the main goal of this is to prevent serum sickness related to the ATG, which is a delayed type of allergic reaction. So we give the steroids for about a week to 10 days, and then we taper the dose over the subsequent two weeks. Side effects of this therapy uh, uh, with steroids can be many, but since we're only using it in the short term, we generally don't see severe side effects uh, from the steroids. And then the workhorse of immune suppression therapy is cyclosporin, uh, which is a twice daily oral medicine. It starts at the same time as the ATG. The key is monitoring levels of this in the blood. Too low of levels will mean it won't work very well. Too high means you're gonna run into a lot of side effects. So we, run it, we monitor levels frequently at the beginning and then slowly start to uh, decrease the frequency of this level monitoring as the dose becomes more stable. The duration of cyclosporin with immune suppression therapy varies by center, somewhere between six to 12 months. We tend to use 12 months of full dosing. And the side effects can be significant. Uh, increased hair growth, uh, which is particularly bo bothersome to adolescents, um, gum overgrowth, kidney dysfunction, hypertension, and then rarely seizures, uh, which can be related to the kidney dysfunction and the hypertension. Next slide. How do you monitor response to immune suppression therapy? Well, the, the goal is what we want to see is gradual count recovery over the first six to nine months. So regardless of which of the following categories you fall into, if your counts are continuing to rise slowly, we're generally happy with that. Complete response is normal blood counts, but some use uh, platelets that are greater than 100. Uh, a partial response uh, means that you're transfusion independent with an ANC greater than 500. And then treatment failure, well, the definitions vary across centers with respect to timing, but at CHOP, we consider treatment failures to be patients who have not recovered their neutrophil counts by three months, that are still transfusion dependent with no signs of improvement by six months. And in, in these patients, uh, we recommend pursuing alternative therapy, generally uh, transplant. Uh, next. And then the approach to monitoring bone marrow biopsies varies by center. The main goal of these follow-up assessments of the bone marrow is primarily to screen for MDS, but, but some folks also like to get these uh, assessments uh, to assess for uh, changes in the cellularity over time. Uh, so routine monitoring varies by center, uh, but at CHOP we generally check marrows at three to 12 months uh, after the initiation of immune suppression therapy. Uh, most centers uh, will agree to recheck bone marrow if patients who have recovered their counts have any significant decline in their blood counts or before any alternative treatments are started if IST uh, ends up being um, a failure. Uh, next. Um, for patients who have good responses in terms of weaning cyclosporine, the timing varies across center. At CHOP, we begin weaning about 12 months after therapy is started, regardless of response. Um, we wean by 20 to 25 percent um, every three months. There are other centers that do something similar, but wean more often, but uh, less of a wean, so 10 percent per month. I think you get to the same point in the end. Um, if evidence of falling counts occurs during the wean, you have a choice. You can go back up to full dose cyclosporin to try to recapture the counts, or what we tend to do at CHOP uh, in pediatric patients, if we know a patient is going to be dependent long term on cyclosporin, um, uh, we tend to pursue alternative treatment, including transplant. Uh, next. In terms of long-term follow-up for patients who maintain great blood counts after stopping IST, we tend to check blood counts pretty frequently in the first year and then slowly decrease to yearly follow-up visits. Um, uh, and then uh, another key uh, a note is you have to continue to check for PNH, uh, which we'll get to in a minute, but uh, these clones can occur late. Next. <clears throat> 
So what are the outcomes of, trans, of uh, immune suppression therapy in severe aplastic anemia? Well, uh, the European Society for Aplastic Anemia published outcomes, uh, which were a little bit uh, humbling. So an analysis of 167 patients, though overall, uh, most patients survive, 87% did. The overall survival was very different from what we call treatment failure-free survival. And what failure-free survival means is that the patient um, is alive and never required uh, additional therapy. The failure-free survival was only 33%, which meant that two-thirds of patients needed to go on to, an, to a second therapy, and most of, most of this therapy was transplant. Uh, in, in, I will note that in Europe, only rabbit ATG was available for much of this study period, and so this could uh, account for a number of the treatment failures that were seen. So next. So the North American uh, Pediatric Aplastic Anemia Consortium recently uh, a retrospective analysis of over 300 patients treated with IST in the first decade of the, of the 21st century. Um, uh, what we found uh, was a complete response of around 60%, an overall survival that was excellent at 92%. But again, the failure-free survival was much lower. At five years, it was around 60%. But unfortunately, as this graph shows, that doesn't reach a plateau. And as you go further out from initiation of therapy, that long-term failure-free survival may be as low as 40%. Patients who had clonal complications, including around 5% who developed MDS, and numbers were not assessed, but a number of patients develop um, issues with PNH. Next slide. So what are clonal complications after immune suppression therapy? Uh, what are clone that a bone marrow stem cells can acquire new mutations or chromosomes? but not on a transplant. And, up, and if you look sensitively by research analyses, which Daria Bacca from the Center for Pediatric Patients with Aplastic Anemia, therapy to develop clonal hematopoiesis. Each caused by mutations of PIG-A, um, but there are other kinds as well. Patients will lose expression of HLA genes, uh, and fortunately, this does not seem to cause other disease consequences, but more rarely patients can develop chromosome changes and other gene mutations, which can lead to MDS. And if you develop MDS out of aplastic anemia, then, then that is a, an indication for urgent transplant, often with more to do a transplant for aplastic anemia. Next slide. Uh, PNH occurs in 50% of patients with pediatric aplastic anemia, although in most cases, it's small. The mutation in the pig A gene, which, to make a long story short, causes a loss of a specific type of antigen on a cell surface that some proteins the blood cells need to be expressed there. of losing inhibitors of something called activated, this causes symptoms of PNH typically affected or greater in the pediatric uh, do not that are that big, but the Nineteen shows that if you clones always uh, tends to remain stable, but clones generally. End of cure, and if you do have patients are still a uh, who have a plastic anemia. If you don't and restored marrow cellularity, then the transplant regimens uh, patients.
from that was the and in weeks for life also quite Depression therapy is that the drug l pag has been given a lot of um, uh, years because of the study that would show that when added to the this in adults. Um, but there's also that show not clear whether or not the PEG actually improves the responses in pediatric patients. There may be a signal in older patients that can improve input response rates in patients less than age 12. Not clear whether that's something that actually improves So the other very different um, being run by the North American Pediatric Aplastic Anemia Consortium to prospect. Next slide. So we will have also a few slides about unrelated interventions plan, and then we'll talk about how to decide how to decide between the two. So in the current era, as I already mentioned, matched sibling transplant approaches unrelated donor transplant improvement for Why the improvement? Well, there are several reasons for this. So there's uh, higher resolution matching practices. Slides, there's less intensive conditioning regimens, D prevention strategies. So one of the keys is that in the patients who receive several courses of IST prior to bone marrow transplant, it's been shown now that second courses of immune suppression therapy are ineffective to increase survival. Plant. The more, more transfusion exposures you have, the more risk of infections, and the more chance you can have clonal evolution going into transplant. And so the United Kingdom's uh, Living Party came out with a study a few years ago which looked at outcomes of transplant used up front for patients with aplastic anemia compared to when being used after the transplant. And what they actually found was a, a higher failure survival, higher success of transplant if you did it as the first therapy versus if you did it as the second therapy. The caveat to this, which is that they used historical controls for the failure of the IST arm, uh, and it's quite possible that if you use uh, uh, concurrent patients, there may not have been that much of a difference. But this study, again, was actually by North American Consortium, if you go to the next slide, come up with what is called the transit study, uh, which is a randomized study comparing unrelated donor transplant versus immune therapy in pediatric patients. This effort is being led by Mike Pulsifer from LA and Akiko Shimamura and David Williams from Boston. It involved nine centers, including ours, in the interest of disclosure. And this is really a pilot study to see whether or not it was feasible to conduct a randomized study of uh, next, uh, so an initial manuscript has been accepted for publication on the findings thus far. There have been 23 patients that were randomized either to bone marrow transplant or immune suppression therapy. 10 to 12 random patients randomized to bone marrow transplant fast enough to be eligible for the treatment. All are alive. Uh, nobody has developed severe graft disease. Of the 11 patients who were treated Immune suppression therapy, unfortunately, failed that immune suppression therapy. The result of this pilot is the phase three study. Next slide. As I mentioned, unrelated donor bone marrow transplants uh, conditioning has evolved over time. In the early days, what was used was myeloablation, like we would use for patients with leukemia coming to transplant. This was associated with high rates. And, high and what was realized is that those patients may not need full intensity 
opening which is used to clear out donor stem cells since the marrows were already what you really need in the regimens are strong immune suppression. And so currently there are two regimens that are predominantly used for this in the United States. One is based on the bone marrow transplant clinical trial study, which combines ATP, fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, radiation. The other is one in Europe and uses fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and a drug called Tocotrizumab, which is a drug, drug similar to ATP, but with broader specificity. And I, I don't know that, the, I think the jury is still out as to which one of these regimens is better. Uh, I think the risks are a little bit different. Um, uh, with the Tuzumab, there's probably a little bit of a high and there are potential long-term risks of including low-dose radiation and side effects of this home practice. Next slide. Um, in terms of um, uh, what a timeline for a transplant, uh, I put this slide up to show that it's definitely the case that unrelated donor bone marrow transplant is more intensive up front than immune suppression therapy is. And it also takes a little bit longer to get to. The average time from diagnosis through donor activation through admission for unrelated donor bone marrow transplant is about six to eight weeks. Uh, there's a month prep for the patient and the donor uh, of, of and the donor also require, or the patient also requires venous catheter placement. There's about a month long admission uh, where the patient receives conditioning, intensive monitoring, waiting for engraftment, and then a phase of preparation for discharge. There is a period of two months after discharge where a weekly outpatient follow up, monitoring for certain types of viral infections, and, and then slowly the entire goal really is by the time you get two months after transplant, you should be off most medications. You're able to re begin revaccinations and you're able to transition back to your pediatrician. Next slide. So alternative donor transplants for severe anemia, the risks are a little different for groups. Infection is the highest risk. Bleeding can be a little bit and because T cells that Cause graft rejection. There are seem to be lower risks mainly because of conditioning intensity. Severe organ toxicity. And immune suppression is used post transplant uh, in, in, in for aplastic anemia patients not only to prevent graft versus host disease, but also to prevent immune rejection. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the big challenges is what do you do if patients don't quite have a fully matched unrelated donor for transplant? Well, there are studies that look uh, at using a 9 out of 10 adult unrelated donor, which shows similar survival, but higher these cord blood and haploidentical transplant outcomes are improving, but there's still challenges, particularly if you're using this in the upfront setting. Uh, but being able to use these one antigen mismatch donors are actually really critical for outcome, particularly if you look across ethnicities, because where it's very unlikely that you're going to find a fully HLA match donor, but if you allow for a one antigen mismatch, the vast majority of patients will be able to have a donor. And so uh, one of the things trying to figure out ways to make mismatched unrelated donor trans. And what we have relied on is a technique called ex vivo graft manipulation. Next slide. And this essentially involves the partial depletion of T cells out of the graft, um, either by CD3 depletion or uh, depleting specifically the type of T cells that cause graft versus host disease known as alpha beta T cells. And we've had a couple of different studies. Uh, uh, next slide. The advantage to doing this is this allows us to use peripheral stem cell grafts, which are collected by, uh, from the blood from donors uh, after mobilization. And this allows us to get a higher stem cell dose. But if you don't remove T cells from a peripheral stem cell graft, there's a high But removing the T cells allows us to decrease the gives us a high stem cell dose that helps us with grafting, grafting risks. Uh, and 
some T cells and some immune cells, it decreases the graft rejection risk compared to fully removing T cells from grafts. Next slide. And some of our outcomes with this, and we've treated uh, 30 uh, patients with uh, bone marrow failure type diseases, most of them with this approach over the last few years. Uh, and we've treated a, a number of patients this way. We do achieve very high stem cell doses with this approach, three to four times the typical stem cell dose that we can get with a bone marrow graft. And this leads to very rapid engraftment uh, of neutrophils and platelets and normalization of these counts, often by 15 to 15 percent of the transplant, which in turn allow, uh, allows us to discharge patients quite quickly within three weeks or so after transplant. Uh, and we achieve high levels of donor chymosin with this approach. And then in terms of our overall outcomes uh, with this approach, uh, despite the fact that patients have mismatched donor, are disease-free and overall survival are excellent. And specifically in patients that we have used this for, for upfront as first treatment, unrelated donor transplant for severe aplastic anemia, we have actually had 100% disease-free and overall survival with this approach. Now, we did have one patient with a rejection and two deaths. These were both in patients who had failed prior IP. And so what this means is, uh, you know, again, these data suggest that it may be beneficial to consider upfront unrelated donor transplant uh, because outcomes may be somewhat worse with transplant if uh, failed IP. Next slide. And then finally, let me just close on a couple of different tips as to how I counsel uh, families to choose between an upfront unrelated donor transplant versus immune suppression therapy. Next slide. Um, there is true equipoise, which means there is a lot of data, but none of the data are convincing as to whether, which one of these two options are better. Um, uh, so I like to take families through the pros and cons of both therapies and, and, and really help to make a decision that way. Suppression therapy, generally the pros are it's well tolerated for the patients who respond well to it. This is clearly the least intensive therapy. Uh, you can initiate it quickly and kids can get back to school faster. The negatives are there's a slower response than with transplant. 50 to 60% of the times, it's not going to be the therapy that cures you, and you'll need to move on to something like a bone marrow transplant as second line. There's a higher risk of developing PNH or MDS. Um, uh, and uh, you don't know if the therapy has worked for up to two years, typically. You're on therapy for a longer period of time, and relapses can happen in the long term. With unrelated donor transplant, the pros are it provides a definite cure. It, it leads to more rapid hematologic recovery. You're off therapy faster, and you have very low relapse MDS or PNH risks. But the cons are it takes longer to activate. It's much more intensive in the first six months, and there are low but real risks of BMT-related organ damage or even mortality, and there are the risks of GVHD and late effects. Next slide. And so this is actually the last slide. And so just some tips as to, as to you know, how I help families through these decisions. Um, one of the keys is to think about how your family evaluates risks, benefits, and logistics of care. There are some families that say, I, you know, I, I want to have as few visits as possible. We want to go on with uh, uh, life as normal as much as we can through this. And, and for patients like that, uh, you know, IT makes sense. For patients who, who are in families who really prioritize a rapid cure, wanting to get this over with so that they can get back to life after it, maybe unrelated donor bone marrow transplant is preferable. Families who want us as physicians to decide, uh, you know, these are the patients that are very well suited for these randomized trials, including transit. In terms of uh, individual risks, this is another way that one can help decide make this decision. You know, for patients who come to me and they already have fairly large clones of PNH or maybe a clone of a MDS-associated gene mutation, uh, I tend to favor using unrelated donor bone marrow transplant. But for families where the donor situation is tenuous, maybe there's only one donor out there and it's unclear whether or not they're willing to donate for unrelated donor transplant, maybe trying immune suppression therapy first makes sense. And, and, and uh, children who have other medical 
issues where organ function might be compromised, immune suppression therapy is less intensive and maybe that would be the way to go. And then finally, uh, next, um, access to initial and long-term follow-up care matters, right? So uh, if you live in a rural area far away from a specialized center that does a number of transplants for uh, bone marrow failure, uh, trialing immune suppression therapy first may make sense for your family, and that's perfectly understandable to do. Uh, and so those types of considerations are important as well. So with that, I just want to close with my last slide, uh, which is an acknowledgement to all of the people on our teams here at CHOP uh, in the Cell Therapy and Transplant Program and in the Bone Marrow Failure Center. Apologize, I ran over a little bit, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Olson. And um, we do, I just wanted to note, we do recognize that there were some times that the audio was lucky. We apologize, there seems to be a, um, internet uh, issue that is occurring. Um, we do have a few questions and thank you so much for um, taking these questions. Uh, tacrolimus versus cyclosporine. Is there a difference in the effectiveness and why is it that um, cyclo is preferred? Uh, cyclosporine has been used for the historical reason that that's uh, where most of the studies were conducted. Um, th there haven't been large-scale comparative studies between cyclosporin and tacrolimus um, to prove that tacrolimus has the same efficacy. There also aren't studies that show that tacrolimus is, is less effective. Uh, we will use tacrolimus occasionally in patients who develop severe toxicities, particularly the gum overgrowth or what we call gingival hyperplasia from cyclosporin because tacrolimus is, is, uh, does not cause that same side effect. I will note that after transplant for immune uh, suppression, our standard is using tacrolimus and most studies uh, that have been conducted uh, use tacrolimus in that setting. But for IST, most of the data is with cyclosporin, which is why it's still used. Thank you. Uh, this question comes from um, a parent. Their daughter had a life-saving liver transplant in 2014 diagnosed with a very severe aplastic anemia. The brothers weren't a match, so the uh, daughter went um, horse ATG. She's six years out and is doing well. She takes tacrolimus for her liver. Do you think these medications are also helping maintain her bone marrow? Uh, so I've actually encountered a few cases similar to that um, in my time, and I, and I actually do think that tacrolimus probably provides a, a beneficial effect towards preventing relapse of the bone marrow problems associated with what sounds like it was hepatitis-associated aplastic anemia. Um, uh, so you know, certainly we have, we have seen that trend. Um, I, I don't think it provides harm to the bone marrow. I think the question that we don't know the answer to is you know, whether that will help long-term with some of the clonal changes that can happen either towards PNH or towards MDS. Uh, you, know, you know, that I don't know the answer to. Thank you. And you may have addressed this earlier in the presentation, but is um, immunosuppressive therapy considered a cure or just a treatment? Um, if it were only considered a treatment, um, I have to tell you, I'd be really hesitant to use it um, in pediatric patients who have decades of, of life ahead of them, uh, particularly when curative therapies, including bone marrow transplant, are available. Um, so when I use immune suppression therapy in children, it is with the intent of, of curing the disease uh, and not just trading one disease for another, um, you know, trading a plastic anemia for PNH, for example. So uh, you know, when I use it, I, I, I do it with the intent that it will provide a long-term cure, that patients will be able to come off of immune suppression, uh, and then will be able to go back to, to leading a normal life. Now, I know that's a very different approach with immune suppression therapy than what is often used in older adults who develop aplastic anemia, where the goal is just to try to maintain blood counts, um, uh, and, you know, and, and they view that more as a chronic disease.
Thank you. This next question is regarding cord blood storage. Um, they already have a um, family member who was diagnosed with aplastic anemia. Should they consider storing before their siblings are diagnosed? Um, so uh, I have actually run into a few situations where um, we have been able to use the cord blood uh, of a sibling donor uh, along with a bone marrow collection uh, as, as the curative uh, cell source uh, for bone marrow transplant. What I would typically say is um, uh, cord blood from a younger sibling um, is generally not sufficient uh, in a stem cell dose alone to make me feel comfortable uh, that, that that alone is enough to, to provide the cure. Uh, and the reason for that is the numbers of stem cells in cord blood are a lot lower than the numbers that you can collect from bone marrow. Um, and so in a situation where there is an older sibling, a younger sibling is born, the cord blood is stored, I think it's helpful, um, uh, but we use it in addition to also collecting uh, bone marrow directly from the bone marrow of the sibling. And then the caveat uh, question uh, uh, to that is, how old does the sibling need to be uh, to collect bone marrow? And, and the answer to that is we generally like the sibling to be close to a year if possible, but we will use, we'll go a little bit younger if we need to, to collect bone marrow from that sibling. Thank you. How does the onset of puberty impact uh, patients? So, so I think there are several ways that, that, that puberty impacts patients. I think uh, for post-pubertal uh, females, uh, I think one of the challenges, particularly if platelets are very low, is managing uh, heavy menstrual bleeding. And at CHOP, we do that in coordination with adolescent medicine specialists um, uh, to try to come up with ways to help uh, reduce the, the possibility of severe bleeding uh, compromising uh, treatment outcomes. So I think, that's, I think that's one critical piece. I think the other critical piece uh, is in regards to transplant, where we know that patients who are prepubertal who, who get the conditioning regimens that we use for aplastic anemia for transplant are at relatively low risk for absolute infertility, um, but patients who are post-pubertal are at considerably higher risk um, for infertility, even with the reduced intensity regimens that we use for aplastic anemia. Um, so for post-pubertal boys, we recommend that all um, uh, uh, strongly consider sperm banking. And for post-pubertal girls, we have discussions about different methods of fertility preservation. Um, some of these uh, are difficult to apply to patients with severely low blood counts because of the risks entailed uh, in the procedures, including egg retrieval or ovarian tissue cryopreservations. But in, in a few cases in the past, we've actually been able to uh, have patients pursue fertility preservation before they have come to transplant. Thank you. If a family decides to undergo um, the um, immunosuppressive therapy um, versus going to training, does a family consider that the um, ATG treatment is not being effective? Is there a time um, three months? Um, when should they start considering that the treatment may not be working and need to look at another option? I, I apologize that the audio broke up a little bit in the middle of that question, but I think what you asked is um, if a patient has not has pursued immune suppression therapy and by three months they're not seeing any improvement, what, what uh, should families consider at that point? Was that the question? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so um, you know, I don't expect patients to be uh, independent of transfusions by three months post-transplant with immune suppression therapy. I think that can take longer. It can take up to six months, and you know, it can even take out to nine months to be fully independent of transfusions, and immune suppression therapy can still work in those situations. Um, but the, the key 
three months is what's happening to the neutrophils, in my opinion. Uh, because if the neutrophils at diagnosis were still very low, you know, if the neutrophils were less than 500, and particularly if they were less than 200 per microliter, uh, that puts you at pretty high risk for infection. And if they haven't budged by the time that you're three months after the transplant, uh, I strongly uh, consider uh, families getting ready to move to unrelated donor transplant at that point in time. Thank you. And our last question for today, how has the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus impacted the start of treatment or starting of transplant for patients? Um, so for patients who are, are newly diagnosed, I would say that I, I have not made any uh, changes in, in how we approach uh, treatment with respect to COVID-19. Um, I, I think that the, you know, where that has influenced our timing of treatments has been in, in patients who have had subpar responses to immune suppression therapy and in whom, you know, we are starting to think that, you know, transplant may ultimately be needed. Uh, for those patients, we have, uh, you know, followed the COVID-19 uh, pandemic closely. Uh, and actually delayed patients where necessary um, just to get us through the peak uh, of COVID-19 cases in the region to try to decrease risks for patients. Um, uh, so I think that it's affected us that way. Now, the other way that it's affected us practically is the National Marrow Donor Program has put in new guidance um, for contacting and procuring um, uh, unrelated donors for transplant. We have been able to uh, get the donors that we've needed, but the processes that we go through are a bit different now. And one of the things that we're doing is we're actually collecting donors ahead of the transplant conditioning um, uh, just to make sure that there is not a COVID-19 related issue with the collection after a patient has received conditioning. Uh, and so that's one of the practical uh, things that have changed, but, it has, but that's mainly on, you know, in the background of what we do. And for patients who need a transplant, we are, we are still pursuing that. For patients who need immune suppression therapy, we're still pursuing that. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Olson, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. If you would like to watch this webinar again at a later time, it will be available on our website within two to three If you're not able to answer your question, you can send it to us at any time in three ways send an email to help at aamds.org, call our helpline at 800-747-2820, extension two, or submit a question on our Facebook page. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, thank you for joining us today, making us your resource of choice on information for bone marrow failure diseases. The AAMDSIF Medical Advisory Board and team are here to support you and your family as we have done for the past 36 years. This concludes today's program. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Olson. Thank you.